Hi again, it's Ryan. The 64 that's on the bench here today is the same one from an earlier restoration video. It has not been fully tested, so that's what I'm going to do today. I know that it will power on. I know that it has video. I know that the keyboard works. Beyond that, no idea. So to test this, I'm actually going to use a test harness. This is the test harness that I've got, and I got this one from a place called Copperlite Computer Byproducts through their eBay store, which for some reason goes by the name AAA Scrap Dogs Unlimited. I'll link to that below. Now, this harness works on the 64, the 64C, the uh, SX64, the 128, the 128D. They also have a VIC-20 version. And if you go on their website a lot of, the, or on the eBay store, they have a note there that says, you know, if they're out of stock, contact us and we'll make you one. And that's what I did because both of these were listed as uh, out of stock when I bought mine. And they were very responsive. I definitely recommend them. Now this harness is actually based on the original test harness that the Commodore engineers used back in the 80s. Now to use this, you plug each of these into the appropriate port. You obviously have to open it up because this one goes into the keyboard uh, connector. If you see here on one side, it says... C64 keyboard and the other side it has for the SX64. We have this one that goes into the cartridge port. You can see here's the ROM chip that has the software. This one goes into the cassette port. It's part of this big ribbon cable here. We've got one are uh, two ports for the joysticks. This one goes into the user port. This one goes into the serial port. Okay. Well, this one, you look here, see on the one side it says it's for the 128 and the other side for the 128D and the DCR. So we're not going to need this one. So let's bring the computer back in here and let's start plugging these things in. So here's our keyboard connector. And you'll notice also that it is labeled with pin 1, pin 20, uh, and, or, and then uh, here it says this one's labeled as key. On the board, you'll notice we're missing a pin here. That's intentional. That's where the key goes. So this tells us which way the uh, the connector has to go on here. So we push that on there. This one goes in the cartridge port. User port. Serial. Cassette. And our two joystick ports. So 
So we're all connected here. Now, for this to work, obviously you have to have some functionality in the computer. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in. Here's my video cable. This is hooked up to a 1702 that I know is working. And then here's my power cord from a um, Atom power supply from Commodore Forever. Now, we're all hooked up. Let's turn this thing on and see what happens. Okay, turning on the 64 now. Takes a second to come up. There we go. The zero page and the stack page are okay. It's testing the screen RAM. RAM screen RAM passed. RAM test one passed. It does uh, a couple tests on the RAM. It's okay. The PLA is okay. Testing the color RAM. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So this is showing both of the CIAs as bad. Hmm. And it also showed the cassette and the um, user port as bad. So it's running through the test one more time. You'll see down here it'll keep a count of how many times it's run the complete test. Same results. Well, we know the SID is good. Okay, I'm going to shut this off. Okay, so here's a screenshot showing the failures. And I have to say that when this first came up, I thought it was kind of odd that both of the CIAs would show up as bad, especially when nothing else was showing up as, as faulty. So clearly there hadn't been a major overvoltage or anything that would have caused, um, you know, widespread damage. And, you know, it's true that the CIAs do go bad a lot, but both of them seemed a little strange to me. Now, once I started thinking about it, I realized that the cassette port was controlled by the CIA in U1, and the user port was controlled by the CIA in U2. So, one thing that both of those have in common is they have that same kind of connector. So I thought, I wonder if the connectors are just dirty and maybe we're not making a good connection there. So I pulled the diagnostic harness cables off of the computer and I got some contact cleaner and I scrubbed those contacts really well with the Q-tip and the, the contact cleaner. And it did seem to make you know quite a bit of difference so I plugged the diagnostic harness back in 
and here's the result. Okay, we're all hooked up. Let's turn this thing on and see what happens. Okay, it's running its first RAM test. It does two RAM tests testing different parts of the RAM. Okay, the RAM is good, the PLA is good. And this says everything is good. Sounds like a good test for the SID. So it looks like we're in good shape. Okay, so what have we learned from this? Well, apart from the obvious that the computer itself seems to be fine, uh, I think we've learned that we need to make sure that our connectors are clean. But beyond that, we need to remember to ask ourselves, do the results of these tests make sense? And you know, analyze the results and not just take them on blind faith. Because I could have desoldered those two chips. I could have bought two more replacements and thrown away two perfectly good CIAs if I hadn't stopped to think, hmm, do these results seem to make sense? And could there be something going on besides the chip itself being bad? So let's use the diagnostic tools that we have, but let's not forget that the best diagnostic tool is one we all already have, and it's that big squishy thing between our ears. Thanks for watching.